first of all, just to say welcome to everyone who has made it to the webinar on time. This is the um, first of our Cancer Research Cardiff webinars. Uh, my name is Arwen Gallimore and I've just become the theme lead for um, cancer in the College of Life Sciences at Cardiff University. And I've set up these webinars in order that as a cancer research community, we get an opportunity to find out what's going on across the, across the piece, so to speak, at Cardiff University. It's obviously difficult to find a slot that suits everybody. And apologies, well, I guess if you're here, that means it's a slot that's kind of, that suits you. Um, but I was um, sort of inspired to choose a Friday afternoon to do this because I once, um, earlier this year or the end of last year, and that's obviously a period of time that feels very blurred at the moment, uh, I was at Edinburgh University doing a viva, I was an examiner there, and I realised that the institute was very empty and it was a Friday afternoon. And then I realised that everyone was actually in an institute-wide seminar series, which they held from half three till half four on a Friday, and then they all went for a beer together. And it struck me as a really fantastic way to sort of end the week on a, on a bit of a high and a way for everyone to get together. We're obviously not getting together, but you know, if you have reached for a beer already, then, you know, hats off to you, fantastic. But hopefully when all this is done and dusted, we will indeed be able to run these seminars live. And the idea will be that they will be um, uh, followed by a chance for everyone to have an actual uh, get together and get to know each other a little bit better. So um, there will be a recording available if uh, for those who haven't made it today and I will let everybody know where they'll be able to um, access that. So I'll now introduce Duncan. I'm very, very happy that Duncan agreed to give the first of these um, seminars. Uh, Duncan has been funded by Cancer Research UK for many years now, including fellowships as well as a programme grant and renewing a programme grant. Uh, whereby he's developed a uh, story around telomere biology and the relevance of this to cancer and cancer patients. At the end of the talk, I hope you can use the questions and answer uh, function to ask um, Duncan questions. I'll be able to help field these. Uh, this is the first webinar I've set up, so if anything goes wrong, apologies in advance, um, but hopefully it, uh, it won't. So thank you very much, Duncan. And just before you start, I'd also like to say another date for your diaries. On the 18th of December, Helen Pearson from Eskri will be giving one of these webinars talking about targeting the PI3 kinase cascade to treat um, prostate cancer. And in the same session, Jenny Swettenham from the Medicines Discovery Unit has agreed to come along and speak for 10 to 15 minutes on um, the MD, MDI, that should be Medicines Discovery Institute, their plans for drug discovery in oncology. So at this point then, I'll, ha I'll hand over to Duncan. Duncan, thanks ever so much. I'm looking forward to your um, talk. Oh, any feedback, please do use the cancercoms at cardiff.ac.uk email address. And thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Arwen. Um, this is a rather strange situation to be giving a seminar in. This is the first seminar I've actually given in this sort of situation, sitting in my spare bedroom, talking to a blank screen. I hope you can all hear me. Um, because it's being recorded, um, I'll try not to say anything too controversial, or hopefully not too stupid at least. Um, I think I'll probably switch my video off so you don't have to look at me talking and just focus on the um, slides. Um, so Arwen asked me to give a general overview, overview of the activities of our laboratory. Um, so I'm going to do that and I'm going to specifically not provide any new data, unpublished data. So it's going to be a very general overview of all the things that we've been doing over the last, well, many years really. Um, so if you want to talk and get more detail from us, obviously, contact me or perhaps better contact the people in the lab, um, which I'm trying to forward the slide, hopefully that's worked. Um, so before you go off um, phoning the um, COVID police, um, this was taken back in September, October time. And this is before the days of social distancing, we're all rather too close, it all seems a bit strange and awkward now, doesn't it? Um, but this is just to introduce everybody in the lab really. So. I'm um, just going from left to right. We've got um, Greg 
and Kate. They're both CRUK funded postdoctoral um, research associates um, in the lab. We've got Kevin, who's WCRC funded. Um, Ree, who um, worked with us for many years under CRUK funding, but left uh, to Pastures New last year. And she was replaced by Marie Hodges. And Julia, who I've worked with for, well, many, many years indeed, um, probably 20 odd years, perhaps, I don't know. Um, Kez, uh, who's a bioinformaticist um, funded by CRUK. Then we've got Alice and Helen, who are PhD students who finished with us this year. And in fact, Helen was the first kind of university PhD student to have a Zoom Viva back in April, uh, which was successful. And Angelos, who's a PhD student who started last year, he's now in his second year. And then we've got Alex Kiersey, who started with us um, on a PhD studentship bioinformatics project working with Kez um, this year, and Harsh Bat, who will be starting with us as a WCAT fellow working in glioblastoma. So that was us pre-COVID. This was us during COVID. So this was actually after um, Helen's PhD viva. Notice we've now learned our lesson and we're now all two metres apart. And then back in August, when um, lockdown um, finished, um, we started touring around CRUK shops. So we had this sort of weird ritual of going to shops and wearing face masks and taking photographs. Quite a, it's been a very strange year as we have all experienced indeed. So as Arwen um, said, we have been funded by CRUK for a long time now, since 200, 2005, in fact, when I had a senior fellowship from them and we've been funded with uh, fellowship and um, programmatic funding ever since. And our recent funding is now started this year and will go on until 2025. And we've also been funded by um, the NIH in collaboration with Eric Kendrickson in Minnesota and various other funders. Um, so I suppose we could summarize the purpose of our lab. This is a sort of summary statement of intent, intent in our last um, uh, CRUK grant. And really, this is what we do in a nutshell. It's essentially to try and understand you know, the mechanisms by which telomere dysfunction drives the evolution of the cancer genome and to see if we can find ways to use this information for clinical benefit. OK, so I'll give you a general introduction as to what telomeres are and, and why they're important and why we work on them. <clears throat> so telomeres, as you all know, are the structures found at the end of chromosomes. Telomere means end part. Um, in Greek, and it just sounds better to call it a telomere. And in humans and all mammals, in fact, it's composed of the DNA sequence TTAGGG, tandemly repeated into long arrays that are many kilobases in length. And so if you have a fluorescent probe against TTA triple G and you put it across a metaphase spread, you can see the telomeres highlighted here at the ends of chromosomes. The, the actual terminus of the chromosome um, doesn't finish with a blunt-ended molecule. In fact, the very end of the chromosome has a three prime overhang of several nu um, hundred nucleotides. And that um, folds back upon itself to form a T-loop structure, this lariat-like structure found at the ends of chromosomes. It can be seen with these, with these electron micrographs here from Jack Griffith's lab. And the idea really is that the end of the chromosome, the terminus, is effectively tucked back into the beginning of the telomere to protect the natural end of the chromosome from being recognized as a double-stranded DNA break. Because of course, there's many stringent mechanisms inside the cell to detect the presence of double-stranded DNA breaks and to stop the cell from cycling and to repair that damage. And if it can't be repaired, then send that cell in either to e into either senescence or apoptosis. And so that is one of the primary functions of a telomere, is to um, prevent the, the recognition of the natural end of the DNA damage response. And it does this via a set of six proteins and many other associated proteins. The set of six proteins is termed the sheltering complex. And Tisha de Lange's laboratory has played the major role in identifying the, these various proteins and characterizing their functions. And really, they nucleate around two key proteins, um, one called TRF1 and the other one called TRF2. They're identified by Tisha de Lange's lab in the 1990s, and they were identified on their ability 
of those proteins to bind with um, incredible um, specificity to TTA triple G repeats. The two proteins have two key roles. TRF1 is primarily, its primary function seems to be to effectively count T telomere repeats. It's a mechanism that controls how long a telomere should be. So it's titrating telomere repeats and it transduces that signal to another protein, important protein called telomerase, shown here, TERT, in humans. And telomerase is the enzyme that makes telomere repeats. Well, I'll explain a bit more as to why that's important later. The TR2 protein, on the other hand, seems to confer what we'd call the end capping function. So it is the function that is there effectively to protect the end from being um, recognized as a double-stranded DNA break. So it represses the DNA damage response. It represses ATM, for example. It's repressing the non-homologous end joining process from, from acting at telomeres and causing telomere-telomere fusions. So if you use a dominant negative um, TRF2 to strip TRF2 of telomeres, you get immediately um, this very striking phenotype of all chromosomes fused together into one great big long effect looks a bit like a train of chromosomes. Okay, so given that we understand the protein structure of, uh, and the function of, of telomeres, why, why are any of us bothering to study it? Well, I think really it comes down to this fundamental issue and this is the end replication problem. And if you consider what happens to a, a um, DNA replication fork as it comes off the end of a chromosome, the leading strand, of course, can be fully replicated right off the end of the chromosome. Um, shown here, leading strand can be fully replicated um, off the five prime end um, of the chromosome. Whereas, of course, the lagging strand, which is composed of um, it's a discontinuous DNA synthesis um, whereby Okazaki fragments are primed from RNA primers shown in green here and they are then stitched together by a ligase where once the RNA primer has been removed and the polymerase comes in and the whole thing is stitched together with, with ligases. What happens when this RNA primer or when, when this, this uh, the lagging strand goes off the end of the chromosome if the RNA primer happens to be at the very three prime terminus of the chromosome, then there isn't another Okazaki fragment to come in to displace the RNA primer. Um, and therefore you get with every round of cell division, a loss that can be as small as an RNA primer. But of course, if that RNA primer doesn't happen to be at the very terminus and instead is further in to the chromosome, then it can be a larger loss of single stranded DNA. The other thing that occurs is that because the three prime overhang is essential for telomeric function to form that T loop and other proteins that are associated with it, then there's also an exonucleolytic processing step that happens every time DNA is replicated that removes from the, from the leading strand, removes some five prime DNA to create a three prime overhang. And so every time cells divide, there's a loss of, of sequences from the end of the chromosome. And with ongoing cell division, ultimately telomeres get shorter and shorter to a point at which it triggers a, a, a cell state that we call replicative senescence. And here we have an example of telomeres eroding with ongoing cell division. So I'll just point out what this gel is, but I'm going to show you more of these later on. This is a technique that we developed many years ago now to determine telomere length, and it is the highest resolution approach available to determine telomere length. And what we're looking at here is each single band represents a single telomere from a single cell um, in a population of cells. You get this distribution of telomere lengths in a population of cells. And what you hope you can see on this gel is a nice example of the end replication problem where telomeres are getting shorter with ongoing cell division. So there's 10 population doublings between these two cells. And then as, they, as the telomeres get shorter, the, the variance of the distribution increases, and that's exactly as predicted with the end replication problem. It's a very elegant um, um, display of, of that happening. And so if we take normal human cells and can't pass out them in culture, they undergo uh, senescence. So they can only grow for a limited number of times. This is called the Hayflick limit. 
um, named after Leonard Hayflick, who, who discovered this phenomenon. If um, a cell population starts uh, life in culture with a long telomere length component, then they will proliferate more than those with shorter telomere length component. Um, so it's very clearly seems that telomere length is very much correlated with the onset of senescence. Whereas, of course, cancer cells seem to live forever. And what cancer cells have done, have up, they've upregulated the enzyme telomerase and they've solved this end replication problem. So normal human cells do not express telomerase and therefore their telomeres erode and that provides this um, senescence mechanism. Um, but cancer cells have upregulated telomerase and they can proliferate indefinitely and they do not undergo senescence. And so this erosion of telomeres, of course, some cells have to express telomerase in order for us to have telomeres in the first place. And I'll show you a slide a bit later about the expression level, uh, the expression of telomerase in human tissues. But telomerase is, is interesting, actually, it's the only um, reverse transcriptase encoded, I think, by the human genome. And so it has an RNA template that uh, templates the addition of TTA triple G repeats onto the chromosomal ends. So whilst telomere erosion um, was correlated with the onset of senescence, it wasn't formally demonstrated that telomeres, the, the experiment that formally demonstrated that telomeres were required or uh, actually were fundamental to this process um, was when the enzyme telomerase was originally cloned or identified and cloned and then re-expressed in cells. And so this is an example of us doing it in, in, in our lab. So you can take some cells, um, put in telomerase and the telomeres get longer and these cells grow forever. They, um, they do not undergo replicative senescence. Um, this is what their growth curves look like. In the presence of telomerase, these cells grow forever. And, may, and many of you may well actually use these cells for various reasons in, in, your, in your lab, uh, like HTERT, um, immortalized fibroblasts or HUVEX and, and endothelial cells and, and what have you. So telomere erosion provides this limit to replicative lifespan um, that prevents unlimited cell growth. And this, we think of this as providing this quite a stringent tumor suppressive mechanism that's in every cell. And the reason why that tumor suppressive mechanism works is because of the way that telomerase is expressed. So telomerase, as I've already said, is, is not expressed in the vast majority of human cells but it is expressed in stem cell compartments. So um, right from the very early days, the only place in the human body where telomerase could actually be detected was in fact in the testis in quite high levels in spermatogonial stem cells. And of course that's maintaining telomere length for subsequent generations. So people start life with a long telomere length component, um, but it's also then subsequently been detected in, in stem cells. So in uh, hemopoietic stem cells, uh, skin, you know, um, keratin keratinocytes, the basal layer of the skin, and what have you. Also, um, in the at uh, the bottom of crypts, the stem cells at the bottom of the crypts seem to have telomerase expressed. But in contrast, in normal tissues, eighty-five percent of all malignancies are being shown to express telomerase. Um, so, I don't know, as an example down here, metastatic carcinoma in the liver, telomerase is expressed, but it's not expressed in normal liver cells. And of those. 15% that don't express telomerase, they appear to have upregulated another mechanism called the alternative lengthening of telomeres mechanism, which is a recombinational based uh, mechanism to maintain telomere length. So irrespective of the telomere maintenance mechanism, some upregulation has to be, uh, some upregulation of any telomere maintenance mechanism has to occur in a malignancy to confer unlimited um, replicative um, his, um, um, capacity. And so, as a consequence of this repression of telomerase and the end replication problems, telomeres erode as a function of age. And this is very reproducible. There have been many, many, many studies using all sorts of different technologies to measure telomere length that have shown that telomeres um, seem to erode as a function of age, both cross-sectional studies as shown here, but also longitudinal studies. In fact, there was even a study that suggested that um, a longitudinal study whereby telomere length could predict um, potential longevity, um, amazingly. 
So yeah, telomeres erode as a function of age. And in generally speaking, people start life with telomeres around about nine to 10 kilobasis. There's an early drop off of telomere length in early years, and then it becomes a more steady drop off of telomere length um, going up to around 100 years old where telomere lengths are around about four to five kilobases in length. Um, females typically have longer telomeres than males, and that equates to around about seven to eight years worth of telomere erosion. Typically, telomeres erode at around about 30 base pairs per year. So telomere erosion is um, not uniform. It depends on which tissue you're looking at. This is quite an old study, but it does illustrate the point that you can see rapid telomere erosion in liver, renal cortex, etc. Whereas some tissues that don't turn over quite as much, so root, um, cerebral cortex or myocardium, for example, um, don't seem to um, erode their telomeres. So telomere erosion seems to be dependent on cell turnover. So as a consequence of these phenomena, um, of these observations, um, many people have spent a lot of time um, or a lot of effort um, characterizing telomere length in a whole variety of human conditions. Um, so for example, um, telomere length shortening has been observed in atherosclerosis, uh, or individuals with coronary heart disease. Um, Tim Spector's lab showed that um, telomere length was, could correlate with, or inversely correlated with obesity, um, and in fact, um, smoking as well. And in fact, even with the numbers or quartiles of cigarette pack years smoked. And all sorts of other things uh, ranging from um, where the, the position that you have managed to achieve in the British Civil Service um, is correlated with telomere length. So your telomeres are longer, the higher up the British Civil Service you are apparently, or if you're a yoga practitioner, all sorts of strange and uh, wonderful studies. But together, there's so many of these things now that sort of telomere length um, may well be a useful biomarker of biological age and potentially disease state. And actually, most of these are probably the cause and effect hasn't always been established, but there's quite a few stories now to indicate that there's definitely a causal role in term in, in telomere length, usually perhaps around the, the concept of um, sort of immunosenescence. Anyway, so as a consequence of these sorts of observations, there's a whole bandwagon um, of people who are interested in flogging people um, pills and things to lengthen your telomeres. So if you want to stock up for Christmas, you might want to buy your loved ones some pills here that will make them live forever. Um, so these are these TA65 um, and various other pills. And there's one here called Tilo Max, this gentleman here, he's looking very well. Um, he actually fought in the, uh, in the Boer War, that's the first Boer War. He has a very healthy colon, he's very muscular. And he's because he's been taking these pills every day um, and you can get creams here yeah? so you've got um, these liposomal telomerase creams and people in the and if there's anybody from the um, stem cell institute you might be interested in this this is uh, remarkable really this is a it's called tell stem activator it's a combination of telomerase and stem cell um, which you can smear on your face and eyes and um, I'm sure you'll look very happy like this lady here who's been plastering herself with this 1,500 pounds a pot cream. And she's looking good, pretty good considering that she's 85. But of course, you, if you're gonna live forever and you've got a pet, you, you're gonna want your pet to live with you. Um, so you can even get it for your dogs. So you know, Labrador here is looking pretty healthy. Um, uh, mind you, you can only give it for dogs over five years old. Um, I don't quite why that is. And if you've got other pets, I mean, uh, I don't know if Matt Smalley's listening, but you might want to give this to your horse. Um, and even smaller pets. Um, so we've got a hamster and um, he recently, we've been giving him these pills for quite a number of years and he recently celebrated his 45th birthday last week. Of course, I'm kidding. Anyway, back to more serious stuff. Um, so um, as I've been saying, telomere dysfunction, telomere erosion um, provides this stringent tumor suppressive mechanism that seems to have evolved in long lived species such as humans. Uh, whereby this gradual telomere erosion together with uh, repression of telomerase um, provides this um, tumor suppressive mechanism. And it's dependent on P53, dependent DNA damage checkpoint response, 
and results in a G1S cell cycle arrest that we call senescence. And we think that this probably underpins the aging process. But on the flip side of that is that it protects us against cancer. So it's potentially an example of antagonistic pleiotrophy. But of course, if the DNA damage response is compromised in some way, then actually cells ignore this G1S cell cycle arrest. They continue to divide to a point at which now the telomere is no longer functioning. It no longer has that capping, end capping function. And so it now starts to be processed as a double-stranded DNA break. And that leads to telomere fusion events. So you end up with chromosomes that are fused. And of course that means you end up with dicentric chromosomes, which at the point of anaphase form bridges, and then they break and you get subsequent cycles of fusion bridging and breakage that results in large scale non-reciprocal translocations. And so we've been studying this process um, for a number of years. We've been studying the process of telomere erosion and senescence. We've been studying the process of how telomeres actually undergo fusion, the mechanism of fusion, and what the clinical consequences are of understanding all of this. So this process is called um, the point at which cells start to um, undergo telomere fusion is a, we call it a telomere crisis. And cells enter a telomere crisis and generally speaking, those cells will die because of catastrophic genomic rearrangements and loss of heterozygosity that's not consistent with life. But from that crisis can evolve something that has now upregulated telomerase stabilize telomere loss and also stabilize these broken chromosome ends with new telomeres and it locks in place that genomic um, heterogeneity that then allows clonal evolution to operate and move on to the next stage so we think this is absolutely fundamental to carcinogenesis the process of of um, malignant transformation um, the progression to malignancy so this process of crisis is what we study quite a bit so i'll be talking about crisis quite a bit. I always, I always like this album cover, Crisis, What Crisis? I don't necessarily like the contents of the, of the record, but I always like this illustration of Crisis, What Crisis? So our lab's key questions, I suppose, could be summarised as, you know, what actually is a short dysfunctional telomere? So given that we've uh, generated um, mechanisms to um, measure in astonishing accuracy, accuracy how long a telomere is, can we actually start to define the length of a telomere? How is fusion mediated? So what are the repair processes that are happening at telomere-telomere fusion? And then what is the impact of telomere dysfunction and fusion across the genome? What are the clinical consequences of telomere dysfunction? And can we actually use telomeric parameters in the clinic? So I'm gonna show you now a an old experiment. So this was published in 2007, so a long time ago. I'm going to dwell on it because it is actually informed pretty much the large bulk of the work that we've done ever since. And so what we're doing in this experiment is taking cells into senescence. So this is this G1S cell cycle arrest. And when you look at the telomeres, so you just focus on this gel here, chromosome 17. Um, I hope you can see the pointer. Um, here is so at, at, at PD25.5, um, there's a distribution of telomeres and those cells are senescent. So those telomeres cannot get any shorter unless we take away P53. We can do that by using um, expression cassette of E6, E7 from HPV. And the telomeres then the cells continue to divide. They ignore senescence. The telomeres get shorter, shorter, and then eventually they start to disappear. If you look over on the left side of this gel, this is a different telomere, the XPYP. At this telomere, we have a long and a short telomeric allele. At senescence, the short allele is around about this length, which is about one and a half KB. But as these cells go into, into crisis, so PD46, PD52, PD53, this is where crisis starts. The telomere gets shorter, gets shorter again, and then it disappears completely. So we wondered, well, what's happened to these telomeres? Have they continued to erode until the telomeres disappeared and we can no longer measure them because they're not there anymore? Or is it possible that they've actually been subjected to a telomere telomere fusion event? So we tested this quite as simply really by um, doing a PCR reaction whereby we have one primer on one chromosome end 
and another primer on another chromosome end. And of course, most people will understand that that's not usually a re re recipe for PCR success, having two primers on separate chromosomes. But in this case, if two telomeres actually come together, you'll get these telomeres, these primers pointing towards each other, and you might be able to detect telomere fusions. And this assay worked remarkably well. So what happened was, as these telomeres disappeared off the assay for telomere length, they reappeared on the fusion assay. So each one of these single bands represents one single mutation event of two telomeres fusing with one another in the background of, in this particular experiment, probably tens or 20,000 cells for each reaction. And so we're able to see the telomere fusions appearing in crisis. So there's a good, really good marker of crisis. And importantly, we're able to detect incredibly rare events. So we can actually look at these events in normal tissues and identify telomere fusion events occurring incredibly rarely, so one in a million plus cells. And also we are able to sequence the DNA of these telomeres, of these fusion events, and we can use that to start to understand the mutational mechanism by which they arose. So here's a little bit of detail on DNA on the sequences of telomere fusion events. And what we have here, so here's an example of one fusion event. So here is the XPYP telomere, here's the repeats, and it's now fused to the 17P telomere. But if you look at the 17P telomere, you will note that there isn't any 17P telomere repeats. Instead, the 17P telomere has disappeared and the telomere adjacent DNA has actually been deleted by over two kilobases. And at the junction point, there's a little bit of overlap, a single base overlap. Here we have a converse of this. So here's the 17P telomere, here's the 17P telomere repeats. And at the junction, there's a little bit of overlap. And the XPYP telomere has disappeared and it's been deleted by about 200 base pairs. And then here's an example where both telomeres have been deleted and the telomere adjacent DNA has been deleted. So this is a very characteristic mutational profile that we observed in the vast majority of telomere fusion events. We also observed some more complex events. So for example, here we have the XPYP telomere fused to the 10Q telomere, but between the two is a lump of DNA that's come from a completely non-telomeric part of the genome somewhere um, on 8Q24.3. It's just a piece of DNA. Again, you have overlaps. Again, at, at 10Q, there's a deletion of 1.5 kb, and then there's an overlap here, a microhomology overlap. Again, characteristic of the events. We see sister events where the 17p telomere is fused to the 17p telomere, and again, a short telomere, a little bit of microhomology overlap, and then the 17p telomere, the sister that it's, it's, um, it's fused to, is, has, a, has a deletion of nearly three kilobases. And we see ring chromosomes where, in this case, one end of the XPYP is fused to the other end um, of the X chromosome, XQYQ. So you get quite complex events. And so what we've observed then with this old study now is that telomeres at the point of fusion are very short indeed. In fact, there's a mean of around about 5.8 repeats of pure TTA triple G repeats at the point of fusion. And we observe this microhomology that I was pointing out, in this case, a mean of around about two nucleotides, and we see subtelomeric deletion. The subtelomeric deletion goes at least as far as our assays, which are, go out about 6 kb away. And our impression was that if we moved our assays further and further away from the telomere, we'd still be able to detect telomere fusion events. And so we think this deletion is extensive from extensive resection that occurs when a telomere becomes short. And these are all indicators of the types of mechanism that may be generating telomere fusion events. And we think it's consistent with this error-prone um, non-homologous end-joining pathway, the alternative NHEJ pathway. So I don't know how many of you will know much about um, NHEJ, but the, the standard NHEJ pathway, non-homologous end-joining pathway, is this Q-dependent uh, ligase four dependent process um, that ligates, as the name suggests, non-homologous ends. So it's it's a low fidelity um, repair event. So it's literally just grabbing any double-stranded DNA break and st sticking them together. Whereas, of course, the high fidelity approach would be not um, homologous recombination, but that can only occur for obvious reasons during certain periods of the cell cycle. But 
So that's quite a well characterized pathway and is very much dependent on ligase four. But the alternative pathway has become apparent um, over recent years um, and it's less well characterized. Um, but there are some key enzymes involved with this. So ligase four is absolutely required for classical non homologous end joining. And when we first started looking at this, ligase three was thought to be the ligase that mediated end joining for the alternative pathway. In terms of DNA ligases, there's only three in the human, in the human genome, ligase one, which is the replicative ligase, ligase three, which is the, li the replicative ligase used for mitochondrial DNA synthesis, and ligase four, which is exclusively used for classical non homologous end joining. Subsequently, though, it became apparent that ligase one is in fact used also for alternative end joining, and we contributed to that literature. PARP is involved in actually both pathways, as it turns out, and DNA polymerase theta in the last few years has become a, a, a key player in the alternative end joining pathway. And in fact, it's considered to be essential for alternative end joining. So what we thought we'd do was start um, in the first studies that we did, we looked at ligase four and ligase three. Naively, I thought, well, if our signature is indicating alternative end joining, then we can knock out ligase three and telomere fusions will disappear. And therefore we've proved that the alternative end joining pathway is, is mediating the fusion of short dysfunctional telomeres. And of course that turned out not to be the case. So we knocked out ligase three. This is it done in collaboration with Eric Hendrickson, um, who has expertise in knocking out all sorts of different DNA repair enzymes. And he sent us those cells. And so this is looking for telomere fusion events. We've done two different assays here. One looking for a very simple assay, just looking for that I originally illustrated to you, XPYP fused to 17P. And if you get bands that hybridize with both probes, you, that means that they're inter-chromosomal fusion events. Or we can analyze with just a single primer. So this is a PCR with one primer. And in that case, the only event that we can amplify there is a sister chromatid fusion event. So it only detects with a 17P probe. And so rather disappointingly, we knocked out ligase three and found that we couldn't really change the much in the, in the way of the spectrum of fusion events. But strikingly, when we knocked out ligase four, we found that these interchromosomal fusion events were completely abrogated. We couldn't see them at all on this, in this particular experiment. So ligase four seems to be required for interchromosomal fusions, but the jury was still out as to what was mediating sister chromatid telomere fusion events. So to cut a sort of long story short, and this is the fruit of lots of data that Kate has generated over the years, this is showing um, uh, sequence analysis of telomere fusion. So this is actually using high throughput sequencing, which I'll show you briefly later and explain how this is done. But all we're looking at here is in red is, this, is the DNA, the microhomology observed in sister chromatid events compared to interchromosomal events. And for all of these, the first thing to observe is that interchromosomal fusion events um, have less microhomology than sister events. And so that is consistent with the role of ligase four in mediating uh, and, and classical non-homologous end joining in mediating interchromosomal fusion events. If you knock out ligase four, the events that you see are very rare. And also you seem to lose the, um, or the, the amount of uh, micromology seems to increase consistent with the idea that what interchromosomal inter events we are observing in the absence of ligase four are potentially mediated by the alternative end joining process. And we had a double knockout here of ligase three and ligase four. So we take out away ligase four, so you see this reduced numbers of um, interchromosomal fusion events. But importantly, even in the absence of ligase three and ligase four, we still get plenty. In fact, if anything, we probably get even more sister chromatid events. Um, and that, unfortunately for us, really um, indicated a putative role for ligase one in, sister, in mediating sister chromatid fusion events. And so Kate was um, really enjoyed working on this particular project because ligase one is incredibly difficult to work with because it is the replicative DNA ligase. And when you knock out ligase one, the cells die. 
Um, so it makes it extremely difficult to do anything with, um, because most of the experiments we've, be, we've been doing thus far is we'd take a genetic knockout of a ligase of interest, we'd take those cells, uh, we'd divide, we'd passage them in culture all the way through to crisis, and then watch what happens to them when they hit crisis. If the cells can't divide, you can't do those experiments. So Kate developed this, um, these talon-specific, these tumor-specific nucleases. We like to use talons because it, we like the uh, specificity that they provide, and also they provide a very robust cleavage event. So this is a customized talon, it makes a double-stranded DNA break, just a few bases away from the telomere. You can see the TTA triple G repeats at the beginning of the 17P telomere. There's another talon that cuts at the 21Q family of related telomeres. So we can look at two different types of events with this. You take away one single telomere and see how that behaves, take away multiple telomeres and see how they behave. And then we can couple that with our single molecule fusion assays and we can see the induction of um, telomere fusion events when the talon is introduced into these cells. And they can be sequenced and we see these complicated events. We see microbiology, we see deletions, um, they very much recapitulate what we'd observed in cells undergoing crisis. So Eric Hendrickson generated a um, um, AAV gene targeted uh, ligase one heterozygote uh, flox cre ER inducible line. So the remaining ligase one allele could be floxed out uh, upon the addition of um, 4 hydroxy tamoxifen. And in a lot of work was undertaken. It could be summarized in one brief uh, blot really here. So this is the control cells. So if you put in the 70p talon, you get um, events um, as we predict. If you put in the 21q talon, you get events that you can take with 21q probe, but not with the 17p probe. You put in hydroxy uh, tamoxifen, take away ligase one, and these events seem to be abrogated. We don't see them and yet the 21Q events can still be detected. So it seems to be that the absence of ligase 4 resulted in a, an absence of sister chromatin telomere fusion events, but it did not seem to affect interchromosomal telomere events. So we concluded there was a very specific effect or requirement for ligase 1 to mediate sister chromatin telomere fusion events. So we're carrying on with this work um, we've done some, uh, Alice who finished in our lab has, has been studying the role of pole Q in this sort of process. Julia is currently studying the role of RAD52, which is a uh, protein involved for homologous recombination. And Greg has done a lot of work looking at the mechanisms by which DNA is resected. So how do you end up with those deleted telomeres? And that's ongoing work. I wasn't going to show you that new data. But another interesting observation that came out of these experiments was that the absence of these DNA ligases actually affected the ability of cells to escape from crisis. So although ligase 4 seemed to have a phenotype in terms of telomere fusions, interchromosomal fusions, it didn't seem to affect the ability of cells to escape crisis. So here's cells going into crisis and then the, the clones escaping. Whereas if you take away ligase 3, the cells go into crisis, but they absolutely cannot escape. Whereas if we complement uh, ligase 3 cells with, with nuclear ligase 3, they can all escape. And if we complement it with mutant versions of ligase 3, they don't escape. It was really clear phenotype and quite striking. We then moved on to look at PARP deleted cells. And those cells can enter crisis, but they do not escape as well, ex with the exception of one irritating clone that did escape. And so that led us to sort of consider, well, these, some of these targets are druggable, and there's quite an interest in developing uh, DNA damage response inhibitors from the pharmaceutical industry. And so we started um, testing to see whether we could use these drugs to modulate the ability of cells to escape a telomere crisis. And lo and behold, we found that uh, Laparib, at, at different concentrations of Laparib or Racararib, these are both PARP1 inhibitors, or seem to modulate the ability of cells to escape crisis. And so um, we think that um, there's a potential there to um, examine further all these different um, DNA damage response inhibitors. And um, Angelos in our lab is currently working for a panel of, of, of various um, inhibitors, including we one inhibitors and um, other inhibitors that are all, I think, um, currently undergoing clinical trials. 
We're also interested in looking at uh, POLQ inhibitors as of when they come available. So we think this is a potential mechanism to interfere in the process of crisis to stop the very early stages of tumor genesis and also potentially provide a mechanism by which we can, by, by which we can stratify patients for these types of, of treatments. So telomeres, of course, as I've been alluding to, um, telomere dysfunction generates uh, genome instability, as I've been, as I've been um, explaining. But all of the things I've shown you so far are based on cells in culture. So that, that's playing around with um, unusual cells doing genetic knockouts and forcing those cells into crisis and studying that process in detail. But that's all very well, but does it actually occur in cancer? And so we've had multiple projects over quite a long num number of years now, looking using our high resolution assays for telomere length and telomere fusion to study telomere dynamics in various different tumor types. So there's a few of them detailed here. And um, we've, we've looked in all sorts of, and we're actually interested in looking in any tumor really. So if there's any clinicians listening and you have cohorts of patients, uh, we'd really like to look at them, particularly if you have um, clinical follow-up data. So here's just a quick snapshot of what telomeres look like in cancer. So here's a study that we did a number of years ago now in colorectal cancer. And consistent with previous observations, you can see that some tumors have very short telomeres compared to the, the, um, the normal mucosa. Um, the normal mucosa also suffers a, a erosion as a function of age. We showed that in our data. Other people have shown that. And Ian Tomlinson's lab published, I think, last year or the year before, to show that telomere length of normal mucosa is actually predictive of risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, we see it in breast cancer, so there's examples of short telomeres in breast cancer, multiple myeloma, this is a particularly beautiful example where you've got CD138 negative and positive, so it's the myeloma CD138 positive plasma cells, there's almost fresh air between these telomere length distributions. Um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, so this is late stage chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Here's the normal B cells, this is a B cell neoplasm, and here's the very short telomere that you can observe. In fact, this was the shortest telomere that distribution ever recorded in a human being, and sadly that patient passed away with their disease shortly after being analysed. So that's in the full-blown carcinomas. What happens if we look in early stage lesions? Well, here's and some examples of that. So we've got uh, colorectal polyps, um, and we can see the um, telomere length of, of very small, these are, these are less than a centimetres inside, in size. The telomere length distributions we see in polyps um, vary, some are long and some are short. The ones that are short are within the length ranges that you see in the full-blown carcinoma. So we conclude that the telomere length that we see in a polyp is already set, it's the same telomere length that you see in the carcinoma, there's no further telomere erosion. And these are such early lesions that the amount of cell division to account for, for example, where you have a B cells with a mean telomere length of nearly 10 kilobases compared to a B cell clone with a telomere length of 2.7 kilobases. If we, if we invoked telomere erosion to go from here to there, the amount of cell division to create that would create a tumor the size of Saturn if you added it up, if you just um, if you if you multiplied up all the, the cell weights and the number of cell divisions required. So clearly that is unlikely to be a scenario. And so we, if you actually look at these telomere length distributions, we observe that, um, we observe that um, the, there's an overlap. So you have a range of telomere lengths in these, uh, these, these normal B cells, and there's a potential overlap with some telomeres being already in place. So we think our data points towards the concept that the telomere length of the initiating cell dictates the telomere length of the resulting lesion. And so we think that if these cells have short telomeres, they may have a, what we might call a telomere mutator phenotype. So we're keen to, to look in other early stage lesions, in particular, quite interested to get access to samples with MGUS or smoldering multiple myeloma or um, MBL. These are the early stage lesions that predispose to multiple myeloma or chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But in principle, we'd like to look at any early stage lesion so long as we can get fresh frozen material. So whilst we can see um, detect, so we can see short telomeres, we can also detect telomere-telomere fusion events occurring in these very early stage lesions, so in colorectal polyps, 
we see fusions occurring and they look the same as what we have been observing in our cell culture models. And if you look at Codorex or polyps or early stage CLL with long functional telomeres, with the, this old fashioned array CGH technology that we don't really use anymore, but it illustrates quite nicely there's a rather stable genome there in contrast to lesions that already have short telomeres and fusions, we see these genomic um, events occurring there. So telomere dysfunction and fusion um, occurs, is, 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 um, occurs very early in the progression in some, in some um, samples. And it seems to be coincident with large genomic um, mutation. So how does, so that's a correlation it indicates telomere length may have something to do with, with large scale genomic mutation. So what's actually happening? Well, as I alluded to earlier, of course, telomeres can fuse to other parts of the genome. They don't just fuse with themselves and start off cycles, anaphase, bridging, breaks, and fusion. It turns out that telomeres can actually fuse with other parts of the genome. And so what we observed here that I explained earlier, where we've got XPYP telomere, the 10Q telomere, there's a piece of DNA sandwiched in between from 8Q. This is what we call a telomere sandwich. So you have a telomere, a telomere, a non-genomic insertion. And because sequencing these events is incredibly tedious and really quite difficult to achieve, we started to apply this single molecule fusion technology and to put it in to use high throughput sequencing to characterize large numbers of these events with a view to starting to understand the impact that telomere dysfunction has across the whole of the genome. And when we do that, we can start to map where these events are. So here we have an example of 17P, 21Q telomeres fused to a piece of DNA from chromosome one. And this is the sort of thing that we typically see. So we start to see telomeres. This is our telomeric sequences fusing to, to places all over the genome. Sometimes it's to telomeres, sometimes it's to telomere adjacent, uh, sorry, uh, non-telomeric sequences. And so we're now in the process of trying to characterize the nature of these types of loci that have been subjected to fusion with dysfunctional telomeres. And it's fairly early days at the moment. But this is the sort of thing that we can see. So you zoom in, you can identify the fusion event, you can identify the participating telomeres, and you can see whether there's any genomic features um, that's associated with these sorts of events. Uh, we looked at this technology, uh, we used this technology to look at telomere dysfunction in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And here we have a panel of nine CLL patients where we did this, this um, um, high throughput sequencing of telomere fusion events, and you can see the mess that these things are, are, are um, creating inside these CLL genomes. You've got telomere telomere fusions, but you've also got telomere non-telomeric fusions. And what we've observed is that um, telomere fusion seems to be non-random. And indeed, in CLL, we seem to see more fusion events occurring at chromosome 17p compared to other chromosome ends. And 17p is, of course, important because that's the chromosome end that where, seven, where the p53 gene is located and P53 and 70P is, is lost in poor prognostic CLL patients. It also importantly seems to be associated with coding regions. Um, and so in this study, we observed that telomere fusion loci um, seem to be associated with the genes that are upregulated in, in these B cells or this B cell neoplasm, and also associated with copy number changes in CLL. So, we think that telomere dysfunction provides a kind of mutator mechanism. If you have a, 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 um, a clone that's, that's proliferating out with short telomeres, we think that generates the genomic uh, heterogeneity and diversity that clonal selection can then use to um, facilitate um, the progression of that malignancy. So we're looking at this in more detail. Um, we've got some data now that um, Kate is, is writing up on telomere crisis in more detail, looking at telomere fusion events. We actually want to do an even larger scale analysis to absolutely saturate this uh, telomere fusion um, assay to identify all the loci around the genome. And then we're going to start working in, in, other, co in other cancer types. Um, Harsh will be looking in GBMs. We're also interested in doing applying this technology going back to the colorectal uh, donatus polyps. That's all ongoing work. <clears throat> but one thing that um, cropped out of this work was that um, there seems to be association between telomere dysfunction and crisis and chromothripsis. So chromothripsis um, 
you may or may not have heard of this, but it's a very striking phenomenon that was originally characterized by Peter Campbell's laboratory. And actually, interestingly, it happened to be identified in CLL. So when they first started sequencing cancer genomes, they identified these astonishing hot spots of mutation in the genome, the short patches in the genome that had undergone multiple genomic rearrangements. And they thought it looked like the chromosome had been broken up into little pieces, it shattered, and then being stitched back together, hence they called it chromothripsis, chromosomal shattering. And once it's been stitched back together, they seem to have lost some sequences and you've got this highly random uh, rearranged pattern. And that was what they inferred from their original observations. So we had a look at this and we found that if we take cells into telomere crisis and let them escape and then sequence the genomes after they've escaped, we also see telomere uh, chromothripsis. So we think that telomere crisis can, be, can actually generate chromothripsis. We see this incredible uh, genetic, uh, these mutational events occurring in such uh, small regions of the genome. And indeed, CARES was able to um, undertake, um, con, uh, con, uh, to uh, create contigs from our sequence data, short contigs. And here's an example of one that had one and a half KB as a sequence. And within this one and a half KB, are 13 separate breakpoints. And here's the complex pattern of these breakpoints going all over chromosome 8, over to chromosome 17 multiple times. And so <clears throat> we have extended that recently now into a cohort of samples where we got um, whole genome sequencing um, from breast cancer samples. And we again observe chromothripsis. That's consistent with the literature. Everybody else has seen chromothripsis in breast cancer. But importantly, we only see chromothripsis in samples that have the short telomeres. And this is a fusion threshold that we've defined in telomeres. It seems to be coincidence with the generation of this genomic complexity. So chromothripsis um, is, occurs during telomere crisis. Importantly, it occurs in the absence of non-homologous end joining. And the profile, this observation of, of the absence of non-homologous end joining, and also the particular profile that we observe here is consistent with a replicative repair process, such as micromology mediated break induced replication. And so we're continuing that work to study the genetic determinants of telomere driven chromothripsis, looking for signatures of telomere dysfunction uh, around cancer genomes. So I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. So <clears throat> we've shown all of this, this is all um, sort of basic discovery science. And great, it's interesting, we can publish papers on all of this, but what actually is important about this? What's the clinical consequence of telomere dysfunction? And this goes back to our original work with, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We observed in early stage patients, stage A patients, so these are patients that have actually probably gone into hospital with something else, they've had a blood film done and they've been told they've got a leukemia. So they have not clinically progressed with the disease. And yet, when you look at their telomere length profiles, it's apparent that some individuals have very short telomeres um, that are within the range that you see in individuals with stage C disease who sadly succumb to their disease, whereas others seem to have quite long telomere length profiles. So we asked the question, could we actually use telomere length to stratify patients um, and see whether we could provide a pro prognostic signature for these patients? And so what Seth in the lab did was sequence uh, characterized telomere fusions in stage A patients, and we defined a telomere length threshold below which telomere fusions could be detected in CLL. And then we used this threshold to see whether we could stratify patient cohorts that we had in the lab. So this is all collaborative work done with Chris Fagan and Chris Pepper. And we defined this fusogenic range using the stratify patients, and this is the sort of Kaplan-Meier survival curves that we were generating. Um, on the top here is the CLL patients stratified based on telomere length. The important one really is the curve on the right, um, which is the stage A patients only. So it's prior to clinical progression. This is where prognosis is particularly important. And we essentially seem to be defining two separate diseases almost. There's a short telomere disease that's much more severe with a median survival of around about five or six years versus a long telomere CLL disease where there's all, there is no, we can't work out the median survival. There's a 95% survival at 10 plus years. If you compare that to the other prognostic markers, the level of acuity is simply way beyond for telomere length. 
um, that's prognosis and that's of, of use to uh, of interest to patients but less of interest to to clinicians and what we really need to be seeing is whether telomere length can um, stratify patients for chemotherapy or for, for therapeutic um, um, risk stratification and we've got um, uh, we've able we looked at some clinical trial cohorts here and showed that telomere length was the only marker that could predict response to the gold standard um, for darabine cyclophosphamide and rituximab therapy. In fact, the other markers show no prognostic uh, or predictive significance whatsoever. Um, so that's one application of high resolution telomere length analysis. We looked at it in myeloma. I've already shown you these myeloma blots. So we'll just go straight to the Kaplan Meier curves. So this was actually a very crude analysis um, of multiple myeloma bone marrow aspirates. These are not purified cells in any way at all. And yet, based on our telomere length assay, high resolution assay, we're able to, to split up this cohort very nicely. In fact, pretty much as well as you could do with the ISS score. And in fact, you can actually combine the two so that if you have individuals with a long telomere length um, uh, profile and a low ISS score, they have a relatively good prognosis for myeloma. Conversely, of course, if you have short telomeres and a high risk ISS score, you have a very poor prognosis. So we think this is a pretty powerful prognostic marker. It's an independent prognostic marker. And we would like to see this type of um, approach included in the kind of prognostic and predictive algorithms required that are used for these various different malignancies. So we've got ongoing work in this area. We're hoping to characterize a large cohort of CD138 positive um, samples fairly shortly. We observe a signature also in, in other hematological malignancies such as um, MDS, but not in AML, which um, MDS is a precursor to AML. We've seen it in breast cancer. So if you look at the high risk MPI score breast cancer, we can split those up very nicely indeed. Um, and so we're, we're undertaking more work in, in, in other tumor types. And again, Harsh will be looking at the prognostic significance of telomere length in GBMs. And Alex will be looking at uh, genomic signatures within, um, uh, within cancer genomes, published cancer genomes. So some, some key take home points really is one that telomere dysfunction is provides a sort of mutator mechanism we think drives the um, heterogeneity and clonal progression. Um, we think that telomere dysfunction during crisis can actually induce chromothripsis. It occurs very early in malignant progression. In fact, telomeres, short telomeres are probably already in place in the originating cell. And this fusion threshold coupled with high resolution telomere analysis is highly prognostic and predictive. And so the technologies that I've been showing you so far are, um, we, we use them in our academic lab, but they're quite um, long-winded and difficult to use. So over the last few years, we've been developing it now into a, into a um, higher throughput um, application that's suitable for clinical, uh, clinical laboratories. And we've developed what we call HD Stellar. We call the other ones now single molecule Stellar. We've got HD Stellar. The two correlate really nicely. And really importantly, it has a very low measurement error. So this CV of this assay is well below two, um, which means that it's of has a real clinical utility. Um, so this is just a measurement error shown in CLL samples or in normal PBMC samples. And so this, this assay is now, we've obviously had to patent this assay, and we're now making this available to, to the community. And there's three major applications for it. One, prognostics and prediction response treatment, which I've already alluded to. The other one is in the diagnosis, the diagnostic workup of individuals that have uh, mutations, uh, germline mutations in the various genes involved in telomere metabolism. These are called telomere, telomereopathies. And these individuals exp um, um, have extremely short telomeres indeed. I mean, quite tragically short telomeres. And so telomere length can be used in the diagnostic workup of those individuals. But also more recently, um, there's been a, obviously a move towards cellular therapeutics and of course, if um, people are taking uh, T cells and other, other immuno, uh, immune cells out of the body and expanding them up and then putting them back into people, there's the potential for large amounts of replicative telomere erosion. And therefore, high resolution telomere length has real applications in terms of patient selection, identifying patients with long enough telomeres 
to be able to produce a useful product um, also for product development so the process by which these these various products are generated and also for quality control purposes so I'm conscious I've now gone on for an hour so I'm going to stop there I'm going to say thank you to everybody who I've already acknowledged at the beginning and I'm going to stop there okay thank you Thank you very much, um, Duncan. That was absolutely fabulous and a really good example of, you know, this sort of parallel process between, you know, and trying to understand the biology and applying it for um, uh, clinical utility. Thank you very much. So with that, I'd like to sort of invite some questions from our attendees who are um, welcome to use the, um, the question and answer function. Uh, while that's happening, though, Duncan, I, I do have some questions to ask you. So you, with the immunology, you're talking about um, looking at telomeres in T cells in order to assess their fitness. Is that right? Before putting them into a patient? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Okay. Um, what we've actually observed is that um, so, so, so T cells will obviously go undergo replicative senescence and they will do that at a particular telomere length. Yeah. We've observed actually that they lose their polyfunctionality at a longer telomere length. So whilst you can generate a T cell that is capable of cell division, so you can stimulate it and make it divide, if the telomeres are of a certain length, it can no longer show, uh, provide the, uh, have that polyfunctional capacity. And so there's, there's effectively sort of two telomere length thresholds in these cells, one for senescence and then one for the point at which they've, they've kind of exhausted their functional capacity, even though they still have some replicative capacity. OK, and this has been done with um, uh, in, in association with sort of phenotypic studies of T cells. So looking at different phenotypes and measuring their telomeres side by side. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's a study that Chris Pepper did. So looking at um, yeah, so cytokine um, responses and things for these cells and for T cell person, you know. So. Has, has that been published, that work? No, no, it hasn't. No, oh, that's there's unpublished observations at the moment. Fantastic, thank you. So the other thing that I wanted to ask you is, that, well, there are two other things, actually. One is about um, the genetic heterogeneity. So you talk about the mutator mechanisms. So is this a potential means by which one could generate new antigens and and has this been sort of looked at or thought of um yeah absolutely i mean if you're scrambling up the genome you're yeah. going to be scrambling up the you know the the genes that are expressed there so yes you will be generating new antigens and so actually that that is a an aspect of our program grant was to was to look at that um in collaboration with um kristin Nadell and and barbara um so that, that is something that we will be looking at so um, it's, it's just one of many things that we're going to look at. Brilliant. Yeah. So can, can you are you thinking of doing something like eluting peptides from, you know, um, different cells with different uh, genetic heterogeneity caused by, um, you know, changes to the telomeres? Could you do that to see if their peptide repertoire actually changes and then in conjunction with exome sequencing and, and so on? Yeah, I mean, that is certainly something we, we could do. Um, I mean, our original plan really was to try to keep it sim simple because it is a small part of all the things that we want to do. So we thought we'd start off by actually just looking at um, the um, RNA profile, the RNA sequencing and the whole genome sequencing in combination, yeah. to see whether we can predict mm. um, the epitopes that are being produced. And then from there, if we do see interesting, because that's the easiest thing for us to do, because that's something that we know about. Yes. If we can move on from there, then yes, absolutely. With there are more, perhaps more functional things that we could actually look at. Yeah. Um, but it was a, it's, it's, it's initially we just want to have a, a sort of look and see um, what the situation is, and then and then take it from there. Actually, so we haven't given it quite as much thought as I should should have done. That's oh, very interesting. Lots of potential there, I reckon. So. Yes. So we have a question um, from John Stafford. Um, I think I'll have to, I'll read it out. I hope that's okay, John, you're there somewhere. John said, it's a really great talk, Duncan. Um, PARP inhibitors are about to come into more routine use for various cancers, for example, metastatic uh, castrate refractory prostate cancer with HRD. This is a long question. <laughs> you maybe can see it as well in the chat function. Oh, uh, I said, can't actually, no. 
Oh, okay. Response mm. rates aren't anywhere near 100%, and there are other HRD with lower response rates. Could telomere length predict response rates better than NSG? Does this... Well, um, that is exactly a question that we would like to ask. Right. Um, absolutely, yeah. So we'd like to get hold of those appropriate clinical trial cohorts to be able to answer that question. The problem is getting hold of the cohorts, as always, um, but also the nature of the samples as well. So typically these types of, if there are any biopsy specimens, they will be uh, pickled in formaldehyde and therefore not of any use for our assay. So because we're me measuring the length of DNA molecules, um, as soon as you cross-link DNA molecules, you lose the ability to determine length. You can detect, you, obviously you can sequence small pieces of DNA, but that's no use from the point of view of our assay. So really we need um, fresh frozen material from a clinical trial cohort with clinical follow-up. That's what we would love to be able to get hold of. And I don't know quite how we go about doing that. We are at, right now, in fact, this last week and the week before looking at a small um, cohort of, of prostate cancer samples, but it's just an all comers cohort that haven't necessarily been treated in particular ways. So we'll get an idea whether there's a prognostic signature there in, in that, but it absolutely would be great to be able to look at the clinical trial cohorts. That's what we want to do. But it's always difficult to get hold of the right material that hasn't been fixed in formaldehyde. Well, hopefully all the clinicians who are listening are thinking of ways to provide you with that. Yes, yeah, that would, that would be great. I mean, that's what these sorts of seminars should be about, trying to encourage people to, you know, particularly the clinicians, you know, others. You know, the, the sort of story is applicable across multiple different tumour types. And so we're very keen to look in any tumour type, to be honest with you. Um, so yes, please do contact us if you've got any ideas. Fantastic. For us to work on. Um, so Paul Shaw is asking, what does radiotherapy do to telomeres? And is this something that could be manipulated to enhance its effects? Um, I don't know what radiotherapy does to telomeres, but if you're introducing double-stranded DNA breaks around the place in the same way as I suppose a chemotherapeutic agent will do, then you are potentially, um, those cells, cells with short telomeres could be sensitive, sensitized to the presence of of, of uh, double-stranded DNA breaks. So you might imagine that, um, that tumors with short telomeres might be particularly sensitive to radiotherapy, more sensitive than those with longer telomeres in a more stable genome. We don't know until we look, and it would be good to look. That's all I can say, I'm afraid, Paul. Yeah, sounds good. So another question, Duncan, um, there's been a lot of um, studies recently linking DNA damage to the induction of inflammation, you know, notably sting activation. And so do you know whether uh, telomere crisis, for example, is associated with sting activation? Has uh, yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, you, you see sting is upregulated in telomere crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a whole story there. Um, that sounds sure. like something that could go in for a CIUK grand challenge, doesn't it? Don't they have a grand challenge, which is... Um, focused on inflammation and another actually on telomeres. Am I right about that? Is there one on telomeres? I didn't notice that. I must admit, I, I probably should make pay more attention to those, um, but the idea of getting a 20 million pound grant is, <laughs> it just, you know, it seems like there's going to be an awful lot of effort and for limited amounts of success. Like, is there really a telomere one? I, I'll I have a look. Um, I, I might have yeah. you know, misremembered okay. well, that. We could buy the two, perhaps we could get two grand challenges, four million. <laughs> but they were two separate ones if, you know, the telomere that yeah. one is there at all. The information one definitely, um, mm -hmm. definitely is. Okay, so uh, last question. Um, Telomerase, you said it's present in 85% of human malignancies. Yeah. Is that also the case in mouse tumours, do you know? And if so, um, could we use a telomerase stain to detect cancer cells in tissue? Um, probably, no, not in mice, because um, yeah. mice are a short-lived organism and they have very long telomeres and telomerase is expressed in all of their cells. So the telomere story doesn't work in mice. Right. So, um, actually, mice aren't the best model, really, for telomere biology. And in fact, mm. in order to see any phenotype um, in uh, telomere phenotypes in mice, they had to knock out the telomerase gene in mice 
And even then it took about four, four generations before, before the telomeres had shortened sufficiently to actually start to see a phenotype and they saw sort of age related phenotypes and what have you. Um, so no, yeah, that they, it's, it's not particularly useful. And also because the telomeres are so long, it's quite, at least with our assays anyway, it's not possible for us to measure telomere length. You know, they're talking about 50 to 100 kilobase uh, long telomeres. And, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that we can do single molecule PCR and amplify molecules up to 25 kilobases. But I think going up to 100 kilobases might be pushing it somewhat. Okay. Uh, but we can, uh, we, have, we have got Stella working in mice, uh, but only, you only see it in um, sort of ES cells, uh, stem cells lines without telomerase and only after many, many hundreds of cell divisions do you actually get to a point where they come into the range of our assays. When they do, I mean, they're really nice. You can see the telomere erosion and everything and interesting things happening, but not in a, an actual mouse. Right, that's a shame because, you know, you could think of some very nice experiments that we could do, but never mind. You could cross, if you want, yeah, you could, yeah. Well, it's kind of a different question, isn't it? You start crossing to telomerase knockout mice into your backgrounds and stuff. But. Yeah, I guess so. So um, we if there are any more questions that um, people have and have forgotten to ask. Oh, actually, Paul Shaw is asking, do we have drugs that shorten uh, telomeres? Um, so there are, um, the, the, so when this story was first developed, when, or when the telomere story and, and, um, and cancer was first established, there was quite a lot of interest in, in um, identifying telomerase inhibitors. And there was a company called Geron that was um, set up in, I suppose, the early 90s. And they developed a, um, an inhibitor called Imatel Stat that they have not been successful in applying that. So it's a, it's an, it works in terms of inhibiting telomerase, but in clinical trials, it provide, it's producing quite a lot of different toxicities and hasn't been particularly efficacious. So most of those trials have failed. Um, and it has been successfully used in a very rare type of hematological disorder. I completely forgotten the name of it. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In fact, Oliver Ottman was on the, one of the authors on that paper. Okay. Oliver might be able to answer that question if he's listening. But yes, there, are, there, is, there was always, it was, seemed to be like a golden bullet, you know, the ultimate yeah. um, um, enzyme to knock out. But of course, if you think about it, there are issues with it because if you um, knock out telomerase, or in the, in, inhibit telomerase, and you've got a tumour with telomere lengths of six kilobases, it's going to be an awful long time, a large amount of cell division before the telomeres are sufficiently eroded to a point at which those cells go back into a crisis and potentially die. Um, and your tumour is going to be very large indeed before you get an effect. So obviously it'd have to be used in some kind of com combination, a sort of debulking type situation, and then use it with a telomerase inhibitor. I think there is still interest, I mean, there is still interest in telomerase inhibitors, and there's a class of molecules called G quadruplex stabilizing ligands um, that are being developed that are specifically designed to stabilize a type of um, DNA structure that occurs in single stranded G rich DNA called a G quadruplex. And they effectively cause a sort of knot in the DNA. And so when the telomere is replicated, you get an immediately immediate and catastrophic telomeric effect. Um, so those have been developed actually, um, and there's quite a few of those around, um, and we'll see how they develop. Um, there is also interest in, um, I think there's actually an oncolytic virus targeted to the promoter of telomer the telomerase promoter, so it only replicates in, in the presence of uh, when cells that express telomerase. Um, that's, that's um, I think, in development. I don't know how far that's got. But of course, you know, your normal stem cells all express telomerase, and so I don't know if you want to take an oncolytic virus that's going to be killing off your all of your stem cells, but I don't know. But there is still interest in telomerase therapies, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Fascinating stuff. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we've had a few comments uh, along the lines of thank you for the fab talk and discussion. So thank you very much, Duncan. So at this point now in real, it, you know, if it was normal, we would be now heading off for a beer. But yes. sadly, we have to head off to our fridges. I'm going to do that right now. So just to say again, thanks a lot, Duncan. I hope everyone comes back on the 18th of December for Helen Pearson's talk, um, which will be great. I shall let everyone know how to access this um, recording. And in the meantime, have, um, have a great weekend, everybody.
Thank you very much, Duncan. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye then.